I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how DAC and storage favorably relate to energy access in the East African context. No, thank you. And um, so, so you're right in the sense that people think about DAC and the first thing they say, oh, isn't it too energy intensive? Like, why are you spending so much energy to remove carbon from the air? And of course, yeah, that, that is a valid um, conversation if you're doing this in a, in a country where, you know, you probably have 80% fossilized fuels, which I think is the case in the US. Um, the case, you know, when you come back, when you come to the global south, and in particular Kenya, the case is inverted for a couple of reasons. One, when we look at our grid, it's about 93% green, so we already, we're already starting from a place where we have renewable energy, and so any, to a large extent, you could say anything that's produced in Kenya is green, or at least has that green um, footprint from its production perspective. But then I think the, call, the, the bigger thing to think about here is the fact that Kenya at the moment, uh, we probably have an installed capacity of about three gigawatts of electricity. And at the bare minimum, we have about 10 gigawatts of um, you know, geothermal potential. You know, I think we've only tapped less than 10% um, of that. Not to mention hundreds of gigawatts of, elect, uh, of solar and wind and so much other renewable energy potential. And for a couple of reasons, we don't mine that potential. Why? Because energy is really expensive, so no one demands energy. No, you know, we don't have manufacturing happening in Kenya because people say electricity is too expensive. And then in the, on the flip side, when you ask energy developers, why don't you develop more projects so we can have more energy, then they say there is no demand for it because there is no one asking for electricity. And so you have this weird vicious cycle where no one's asking for electricity because it's too expensive, and no one's building electricity projects because there, there's no demand for it. And so direct air capture and a few other um, CDR um, technologies that I'll talk about uh, direct air capture becomes a really interesting use case where the world needs it because we need to decarbonize, um, but it requires massive amounts of renewable energy. And so we have this amazing opportunity to say, you know what, why don't we utilize something like direct air capture to create a captive market for energy and then use that as a catalyzing force to now say, let's develop energy resources. And so that, makes, that gives a case for someone who has geothermal potential, no one was gonna um, buy it as it were, to say, you know, I can go there as a dark developer and say, I will buy X number of megawatts from you for the next X number of years, and that becomes an impetus to develop an energy project. And so you can extrapolate that across multiple industries and across multiple things so whether we're looking at green industry, I know, it's, I, know we're, I know we're focused on carbon removals, but whether you're looking at green industry um, or anything else that's super energy intensive and requires renewable energy, finding ways to utilize that to catalyze the development of green energy, which can, can then be used for other things in the economy, I think is a fantastic thing. The last thing I'll say though on the livelihoods, I know we're talking about energy. Again, there's a question about talent. Um, and the fact that we are all sitting here working on projects or technologies that didn't exist a few years ago, definitely did not exist on this side of the world, uh, means that this, and this has the potential to create immense livelihoods and immense number of jobs. So again, there's something to be said about, it's not about inverting resources, it's actually creating resources and actually um, expanding the pie.